knack for turning problems into opportunities. When Spanish forces captured him, they tried to persuade Saint-Denis to betray France. Instead, Saint-Denis persuaded the Spanish commandant's granddaughter to marry him. It's a very clever thing he did. He didn't marry just any Spaniard. It was a particular one. She was his passport. There's indication in later letters that he wrote that, in fact, he cared for her and that they'd had a good life together. So he spoke fondly of her. That doesn't mean that it wasn't a, a deliberate marriage to achieve a commercial uh, advantage. Saint-Denis returned to Natchitoches with his bride, where he governed successfully for nearly 30 years. I have never regretted this step because I have been very happy with her. We have seven children. Even though we have no fortune, God has not forsaken us, and we live a quiet and peaceful life. Louis Juchereau de Saint-Denis. Life was not so peaceful for Bienville, however. Back on the coast, he and his men had built settlements. What they needed now were settlers. I do not see that it would be possible again this year to plant more than 15 minots of wheat, since there are only five settlers. It would be difficult for this country to be able to subsist by itself unless you send at once a large number of settlers who will be able to support themselves. Jean-Baptiste Lemoyne, Sieur de Bienville. He didn't get them. And the few settlers Bienville did receive were ill-suited to the job of building a new country. It was colonized by a handful of men, none of them much oriented towards becoming permanent settlers. They were soldiers and sailors, and they were Canadian coureurs du bois, who were people who essentially lived in Indian villages and traded with them. There were even some pirates from the Caribbean. But it takes more than a handful of men to make a colony. Very soon, it became apparent what was missing. The colonists need wives. Of all the remedies, the most sure is to send women there. Having girls to draw the backwoodsmen into the settlements is the only way I know to make them settle down. Monsieur d'Artaguette, Commissary General of Louisiana. The colony verged on collapse. Soldiers were deserting to enemy camps, and Bienville was forced to beg supplies from his Spanish rivals. Dr. Guillet, the king's investigator, reported to France, there is nothing so sad as the situation of this poor colony. Something had to be done. So finally by 1712, uh, the government comes up with the idea of a proprietorship uh, for Louisiana. That is to get a merchant uh, or a corporation to sponsor the commercial development and settlement of Louisiana. And the person that they select is Antoine Crozat. Crozat was so wealthy that even the king borrowed money from him. As Louisiana's landlord, the first thing he did was to fire Bienville and replace him with a new governor, Antoine de Cadillac. But Crozat's men couldn't do any better. Just like Bienville, Cadillac tried to persuade farmers to come to Louisiana. When that didn't work, the colony was forced to lower its standards a little. Then they decided to send out criminals people that were imprisoned for one reason or another. Many times, uh, families who had incorrigible children would recommend that they be sent to Louisiana. Louisiana proved to be un grand faux pas for Crozat, and he soon became a laughing stock in France. Crozat qui tout contre l'argent, il fuit comme c'est mauvais pour sa vie, il abandonné le Mississippi. Within a few years, Crozat decided he'd better rid himself of Louisiana before it bankrupted him. The Company of the West took over the colony, and Bienville got his old job back.
Louisiana had now fallen into the slippery hands of John Law, the colorful Scotsman who founded the Company of the West. Before coming to France, Law had been sentenced to death in Scotland for killing a man in a duel. Just before his execution, however, he escaped and went on to win a vast fortune as a professional gambler. But John Law's biggest gamble was betting on Louisiana. He had plans for the colony. And uh, this is the famous, what turned out to be the famous Mississippi bubble. People would buy stock in the Company of the West. And with this money, they would hire people to go out to Louisiana. But John Law had a problem. How could he convince anyone to buy stock in a failing colony? His solution? false advertising. He uh, inaugurated a massive propaganda campaign portraying Louisiana as a second garden of paradise. And this information was posted all over Western Europe. In Western Europe, there were many disgruntled groups at the time, people who were not happy with their lives, and they signed up uh, to go to Louisiana uh, under John Law's scheme. Puffed up with overvalued stock, Law's Mississippi bubble began to inflate rapidly. Share prices swelled from 500 to 18,000 livres. Money poured into the company, and initially, deluded settlers poured into Louisiana. Soon a new word was introduced into the French language, millionaire. But eventually, the bubble burst. Investors panicked and made a run on the banks. John Law fled Paris. I acknowledge that I have made great mistakes. I made them because I am only human, and all men are liable to err. John Law, founder of the Company of the West. Once again, Bienville was called back to Louisiana to pick up the pieces. Although John Law's gamble didn't pay off, Louisiana did enjoy a little good luck under his management. For one thing, the colony finally had colonists. The rapidity with which the company has sent the colonists and the others was nothing less than astonishing. In addition, there are the girls from La Salpetriere de Paris. Eight or 10 of them have already married. Charles Le Gac, Directeur General, Ship Island. In the first four years alone, the company sent 43 ships carrying over 7,000 colonists. Of these, the most successful were not Frenchmen at all, but Germans. Bienville convinced them to settle with some other German settlers in what is today St. Charles and St. John the Baptist parishes, ultimately the area to be called the German coast. Before long, they would adopt the French language and culture, and the harsh-sounding German names would soften into French, giving us family names like Foltz, Emil, and Toops. These hard-working German farmers helped to keep the colony fed, but they were not the only new immigrants John Law's company brought to the colony. From the, almost the very beginning, Bienville says, uh, the Europeans just simply cannot cope with the conditions necessary to producing a viable agricultural system. Uh, at best, they might be able to do is have gardens. Uh, so he recommends uh, slavery. In 1719, two ships, Le Duc du Main and L'Aurora, arrived on the Gulf Coast, loaded with human cargo. Most of them probably would have been captured by African slavers and then sold to Europeans. Put aboard ships, didn't know exactly where they were going, didn't know what was going to happen to them. The African slaves brought to Louisiana during the French period came overwhelmingly from Senegambia. The count is 70% of the slave trade ships and two-thirds of the slaves came from Senegambia. 
One of the things that was very, very interesting about the group that came in was their introduction of uh, gumbo to the culture. Uh, they brought in a method of cooking, what they call the fish stew or combo. And as a result of adding some Indian spices like uh, sassafras, which we call non filet, and then the French contributing their roux and another type of gravy, then of course we come up with the gumbo, which is almost universal to southern Louisiana. As Africans and their Caribbean descendants became a part of Louisiana's cultural gumbo, they proved to be indispensable in building the colony. They were highly skilled people, uh, and they knew how to cultivate all the crops which were important to Louisiana, including rice and indigo, tobacco, corn. They were quite good at navigating treacherous rivers and building and maintaining boats and in metalworking. Soon the slaves were forced to put those skills to work in the construction of a new city. This last summer I examined better than I had yet done all the lands in the vicinity of this river. A large town can be built on the lower part of the river, which would be a warehousing port. Jean-Baptiste Lemoyne, Sieur de Bienville. Bienville visited the lower Mississippi River and early on determined that the site that is now New Orleans would be the perfect location for a great city, which would be the capital of the new French Empire in the Americas. In 1718, Bienville founded New Orleans on a narrow crescent of marshy ground between the Mississippi River and Lake Pontchartrain. Many doubted that a city could ever be wrestled from this swamp. But in the end, Bienville's vision prevailed. By the 1730s, the town had emerged as a major commercial center. For most of the colonial period, New Orleans was the only major city in the Louisiana colony. Our town is very beautiful, well laid out, and evenly built, as well as I can tell. The streets are wide and straight. There is a popular song here which says that this city is as beautiful as Paris. It is true that Nouvelle Orléans grows day by day and could become in time as beautiful and large as the principal cities of France. Sister Madeleine de Saint-Stanislaus. French military engineers designed New Orleans to resemble the cities they knew in Europe, with a church and a public square in the center. The city's wealthy founding families lived on Decatur and Charter Street, while craftsmen and artisans settled on Royal and Bourbon. We begin to see the emergence of a distinctive architecture that is reflecting the frontier, it's reflecting French influences, and reflecting island influences. And what is emerging is a Louisiana architecture suited for our climate, our conditions. Bienville struggling city weathered famines, floods, and hurricanes. But miraculously, New Orleans survived and even flourished. Before long, the ragged little frontier town was putting on all the pretensions of Paris. The women are careless of their salvation, but not of their vanity. Everyone here has luxuries. The greater part of them live on harmony, but are dressed in velvet or damask, trimmed with ribbons. The women use powder and rouge 
to hide the wrinkles of their faces and wear beauty spots. The devil has a vast empire here. To conquer that vast empire, the church sent missionaries. But beyond the business of saving souls, the church also shaped the very character and culture of Louisiana. The church was such an intricate part of the very fabric of society that it's hard to isolate or to imagine what Louisiana would have been without the presence of the church. The first missionaries to arrive were the Jesuits, followed by the Capuchin friars. However, some of the most important missionaries to come to Louisiana were the women of the Ursuline Order. When we were within eight or 10 leagues from New Orleans, we began to see plantations. Everyone wanted us to stop and go to their houses and we were received everywhere with joy beyond expression. Marie de Saint-Augustin Tranchepin, Mother Superior. The Ursulines arrived in New Orleans in 1727 in order to establish a school and work in the hospital of the colony. And it was their mission as Ursuline sisters from France to educate girls in the colony. But when they got to Louisiana, they discovered themselves in a slave society, so they had to change their mission and also um, direct their instruction at free girls of color and instruct slave women and children. You can imagine the pleasure it gives us to instruct these young boarding pupils who have never been to confession or mass. We find them docile and anxious to be taught and their whole wish to become nuns. But Father Beaubois wishes them to become Christian mothers and establish their religion in the country by their good example. New Orleans is unique in that it had a community of women religious from France who had a universalist vision of educating people of all races and classes. And, and they spread Catholicism into the African population for the first time and in the first place in, in the New World. This had not been done before. The Ursulines understood that the key to building a new civilization in this wilderness was the education of women, whether European, African, or Indian. They provided the only education that was available through much of the first hundred years. Our story would be a totally different story were it not for the Ursulines. Not only in Ursuline schoolrooms, but throughout the colony, relations between the French and their African slaves were unique in Louisiana. Unlike the British American colonies, slavery here was guided by France's Code Noir. It basically spelled out the rights of the slaves. They were recognized as persons. They had certain rights that even their masses were required to respect. They had to be baptized into the Catholic faith. They could not be uh, denied the right to come to church. If they were married, they could not be separated. If they had children, they could not be sold apart. That was some of the very, very important protections that exist in Louisiana that did not exist in some of the British colonies uh, which neighbored uh, Louisiana. The original Code Noir provided that if a slave became the mother of a child of the master, then the master was obligated to marry this woman, free her and their children. This was the first version of the Code Noir, the French code that regulated slavery. By the time the Code Noir came to Louisiana, this provision had been eliminated. But in practice, this was widely accepted. Many former slaves purchased their family members still in bondage and liberated them. Before long, Louisiana had a prosperous and growing population of free people of color. 
Racial barriers were not very firm at all in colonial Louisiana. They firmed up much later. This was a place where there was a face-to-face -face encounter of people from all over the world. In New Orleans and throughout Louisiana, this global village united to form a new culture that would come to be known as Creole, a word that simply referred to blacks or whites born in the colony. Bienville had finally managed to carve a colony out of the wilderness. He'd escaped storms, starvation, 